honey class. Yes. I'm excited. As you know, I really love the acacia honey. We brought in the black sage and tupelo. And I, when we were talking the other day, I just got more and more excited about having this class tonight. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, we've been very, very excited too. Andrea and I have been busy bees. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> I bet you have. So for those at home, we actually have some people purchased um, honey kits. And what you have in your honey kits will be the acacia and the honeycomb. And you're welcome to try those throughout the night um, and have some fun with them. So Andrea, go ahead and start your presentation for us. Can you all see everything? Well, actually, it's Danielle who's starting. Um, can you guys see the uh, beginning of our slideshow? Yes. All right. Well, um, here is uh, Savannah Bee Company partnering with uh, Love That Olive. And I've got to say, Terry, I had so much fun looking at your website and checking out all of your amazing products. You have a lot of delicious looking things. We try. Um, we're proud we're proud to be uh one of those treats that uh your customers can find in your store so um we are a company based out of savannah georgia and founded by a beekeeper named ted dennard who has been keeping bees since he was only 10 years old um he his father is a conservationist and an art author and owns a owned a large Tupelo forest that he protected um, and that is actually still in a conservation to this day. And, uh, and an old beekeeper rode onto uh, Ted's father's land when he was a young boy and said, um, you know, I, I want to keep my bees on your property uh, because I want to make Tupelo honey because it's the best honey in the world. And Ted's dad, being um, of a very open-minded sort, said, sure, um, you can keep your bees here on my land uh, in exchange for giving my son, Ted, beekeeping lessons. Mm -hmm. So that began a lifelong love and passion. Uh, Ted kept bees um, all through elementary school, middle school, into high school. Um, after college, he entered the Peace Corps. He traveled all around the world teaching and learning beekeeping techniques from cultures all around the world. And then he settled back near his hometown um, in the St. Simon and Savannah, Georgia area. So um, at that time, he went back to his childhood passion of Tupelo honey uh, that, that Roy Hightower taught him was the best honey in the world. So he, um, started bottling Tupelo just hand, hand by hand and giving it to some little boutiques uh, around Savannah. Um, that got picked up by some pretty uh, big um, chains like uh, Williams-Sonoma. And uh, people just kept, he couldn't keep up. People wanted his Tupelo honey. So that leads us to what makes Tupelo honey so special. Um, Tupelo is something that, um, I'm a Georgia girl myself, I'm from um, South Georgia, and the Ogeechee Tupelo tree is a tree that grows in, along only two river systems in the entire world, the Ogeechee and the, and the, um, the Ogeechee and the Altamaha River systems. Um, and that tree you see there in the slide is, is a, a Tupelo tree, which uh, we kind of call our swamp dogwood because they are trees that grow uh, right along the river's edge and the root systems often go down into the water. Um, they are, the tree itself is not only rare, but it also only blooms for about three to 14 days out of the year. So, um, and those little delicate blossoms can be knocked off by one hard rain and then there's no Tupelo harvest. So it's, um, it's a very, uh, delicate flower and without the flower, there's no nectar and the bees can't make the honey. So, um, the beekeepers in South Georgia, down to the northern Florida panhandle where the Ugichi tree is found, uh, often even float their hives on barges down the rivers in order for the bees to get that nectar. Um, so that, that's a really, it makes the Tupelo very, very unique, very hard to find. And it's actually a honey that is so weather dependent, we don't get it every year. Sometimes there's a very tiny, tiny crop, which uh, causes it to be quite expensive. 
Um, Savannah Bees Tupelo Honey has uh, literally won Best Honey in the World on multiple occasions. Uh, there are the Sophie Awards um, that, that try, they have a panel of judges that try honeys from all over the world and the Tupelo has won the gold medal on multiple occasions. Um, it's known as the quintessential honey. It's floral and it's buttery and it's just, it's just perfect. Um, it's also low in glucose, which is really cool because it doesn't spike the glucose level the same way that some other honeys do. Um, that doesn't make other honeys bad, but this does make Tupelo um, a better option for someone with diabetes because of it not spiking that glucose level. Um, I love Tupelo. Of course, Terry and I talked before this, and she was saying that one of her biggest um, desires out of this webinar was to uh, to let people know that there's a lot more to do with honey than tea. And um, I, mm -hmm. I, I like that as well. And with Tupelo, I find it wonderful for baking. Um, it's great for um, uh, for also roasting uh, chicken or pork. Um, it uh, makes beautiful sauces like barbecue sauce. I bet uh, Tupelo with uh, some of those delicious balsamics you have, Terry, would make an amazing barbecue sauce. And a also lot of good things with, with our balsamics and olive oils. Yes. Yeah. So, and then, um, you know, dressings, marinades, there are lots of recipes uh, on our website, and also um, I'm going to share um, an email of recipe links uh, with Terry, so you can definitely reach out to her if you'd like to get some recipes um, for, for Tupelo. Um, it is we'll also be bringing a lot of our own um, ones on our website also in the next week and a half and so. so oh, can, awesome. Oh, I'll, I'll be looking forward to checking those out. Absolutely. So um, that is Tupelo. It is absolutely delicious. Um, it also doesn't crystallize, so you don't have to worry about it hardening in the jar. Although that's not a bad thing. That just means that uh, it's high, you know, lower in glucose. So um, we're going to move on to another honey that you can get right at your local Love That Olive. Um, this is another honey that I love very, very much. This is called Black Sage. It is an evergreen shrub that grows in California and Mexico. And it is a very rare honey that is also super weather dependent. You only get a harvest of black sage for uh, sometimes two to three times per decade, which is pretty, pretty rare. Um, stuck a cool little bee fact in there that bees visit two million flowers to make one pound of honey. So the term busy bees, you know, they really earned that. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah, and then before on the previous slide, I was also put that, um, you know, the average worker bee only makes one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their entire lifespan. Um, so, you know, it truly takes uh, a, a huge hive uh, to make all of that honey. Mm -hmm. So, uh, black sage, beautiful. You've probably seen sage plants before. I, unfortunately, have never been lucky enough to see a beautiful field of black sage blooming, but I can just imagine that it is absolutely gorgeous and smell, must smell amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's a, that is where the black sage honey comes from because honey is essentially dehydrated flower nectar. So, you're really getting to taste the essence of that plant when you taste the black sage honey. Danielle, so, mm -hmm. why, why is it that it's like just four times out of a decade? Is it? It's because it ha there has to be the perfect amount of rain in order for those, uh, those shrubs to bloom, for the bees to get the nectar. Um, so, th so with, um, with the black sage honey, I really love, um, love this for more savory um, applications. Does not have to be, but that's just my personal preference. Um, it is my go-to. My husband and I grow a lot of tomatoes, and so we put up a lot of tomato sauce, and, and my grandmother always taught me to throw that pinch of sugar in your tomato sauce in order to balance out the acidity. Um, of course, there's got to be a little balsamic in the tomato sauce as well, but um, we, um, I like to use black sage in my tomato sauce because I find that you get more depth of flavor when you substitute honey for sugar, especially in cooking. There's just, there's a lot more flavor going on. 
And um, so great for tomato sauce. Um, love it for uh, roasting chicken. It's also great in anything baked, like a, a stuffing or um, cornbread. And I love it for sauces too, like onion gravy. Um, I truly believe the black sage has a little bit of like a mushroomy uh, little flavor to it that's super unique. Um, and it's, it's a all around delicious honey. It's a very deep and rich honey to yeah, it. It's a, it does it have has, a lot of depth when you taste it. Nice. And, and you guys let me know if I'm moving too fast or if you would like, um, if there are any questions coming in that you'd like me to, um, to address, just let me know. Okay. Also on the black sage, when you're talking about it only comes out two to three times in a decade, has that changed a lot with the climate changing so much with rain not being as easy come in some parts of the world, like where this is growing? It, it definitely has there. We went about, I think we went um, over five years between our black sage um, wow. harvests. Wow. So um, this and last time. This year, so This year you had a great um, season. Yes. And we were very excited over that because we had not had it for quite some time. Yes. Um, we like to say, um, so Ted, I think that um, because of Ted's passion for uh, Tupelo, it's led him to really, I, I consider him like, like people curate art. Ted's a honey curator. He uh, finds rare, unique honeys. It's almost like finding this uh, perfect vintage of wine that you love, this fine wine. That, that is how I feel like he approaches honey. And when he finds and, and bottles his honey, um, that is how he feels that he, it's almost like a wine connoisseur that he's discovered something so special that he's got to share it. Yeah. Um, did, he, and, did, did he help also in Jamaica? Yes, he did. He did a huge, uh, he uh, spent a lot of time in Jamaica helping with beekeeping. Um, even more recently, um, he went down to the Bahamas that had gotten hit so hard by the hurricane and it had wiped out an entire community's um, bees, which was a lot of their, um, a lot of their income. And he went down and helped reinstall the hives for that community in Bahamas. There's actually a really wow. cool documentary about it. Oh, that's great. So um, I'm going to move on. And Terry, I think you'll love uh, this next one. It is um, your very, very favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely mine. Yep. This is Acacia. Um, it's such a, I, while putting together this slideshow, I don't think I realized how beautiful uh, an Acacia tree is. So that was really fun to find. Um, it is, um, it's a beautiful tree that grows um, in groves in Hungary and along the foothills of the Alps in Europe. It's in the black locust family and it's known for being quick, uh, quick to grow and it's very, it tolerates dryness very well. Um, actually one of the reasons why it is so dominant in Hungary, I found in some reading is that um, acacia trees were planted in Hungary to help with the sand moving around. And then they happen to be uh, such um, avid growers that they really spread all around the country. But they do make up a huge part of the income um, for for the country, not only for the honeybees, but also for sustainable wood harvesting as well, since they grow so abundantly. Um, the acacia tree, it's uh, crazy to think that every now and then people are shocked that our acacia honey comes from Hungary, but it makes total sense because half of the acacia trees in all of Europe grow in Hungary. Wow. So that is really where the honey is from. That is something I had learned um, because I originally found it in Italy and we carried it all around Italy. So it was great. And we, had, first, and we had some wood products in our store, bowls and different things that are made of acacia. Yes, I know. I yeah. love, I have a little nightstand that's made of acacia and it's really pretty. It's a yeah. nice uh, light colored wood. Um, yeah, so uh, acacia and our very first pack, batch of acacia, Terry, also came from Italy. Okay. Um, we just found a more abundant source in Hungary, and so that was uh, why our, our current batch is from Hungary. Great. And um, so amazing to think that with um, 
with the honeybees, uh, each little individual worker bee only making one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their entire three to four month lifespan. It's amazing to think that still one bee colony can produce six to sixty to a hundred pounds of honey per year. Um, wow, so that's it's, amazing! It's pretty. pretty I haven't tried meat. to do the math on that, but that's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they they are amazing, amazing creatures. Um, so I think you'll notice in these pictures that the acacia honey to me really stands out for how light it is. It's like liquid sunshine. It's, um, it's so light in color. And I think the way that it looks light in color is also a very, um, a very good indicator of how it tastes. Um, it's very clean and light and fresh tasting. Uh, to me, it tastes like the most perfect vanilla simple syrup but with this super uh, satisfying thickness. It's a very thick honey, um, yes. which is, it is very, very delicious and has a great mouthfeel. And um, I love it for any sugar substitute. It's my go-to for coffee. Um, it's also wonderful in yogurt. Um, it's great on a salad. It's awesome for baking. Um, and I'm sure Terry, you, you probably have uh, things that you really like uh, to use acacia for since it's your favorite. I use it a lot. And my daughter's sitting next to me laughing. <laughs> yes, I use it all the time. Uh, I use it even on meats and all my vegetables. It, it's wonderful with our oils and vinegars. I think it's just silky. And as you said, it's just such a soft flavor. Um, I will occasionally catch my husband with it, holding it and eating it with a spoon right out of the jar, which is always really good. But, um, and he's not always a big honey eater like that. So it was always amazing. So it, we just really enjoy acacia honey. We keep it on the counter at all times and just grab it for all kinds of things. Love it on fruit. It's excellent on fruit. Yeah, we, um, my, my husband and I travel uh, for a month out of the year uh, selling Savannah Bee. And we, we call Acacia our honey, our honey converter for people who say that they don't like honey. Yes. They're like, yeah, yes. but you need to try Acacia. <laughs> I, I've done that quite a bit this month in the store. People say, I'm not really a honey person. And I'll say, well, you gotta try this one. And they will leave with a jar. It's so good. Hey, Danielle, we have a question here. Okay. Okay, the question is, uh, how do the bees logistically only source certain flowers for the honey to be qualified as a specific origin? Okay, that is a very wonderful question. Mm -hmm. um, so honey, uh, honey bees have this amazing thing called flower fidelity. Um, so that paired with strategic beekeeping, um, so, and that strategic beekeeping part is placing your hives in an area, so honeybees only travel about three to five miles from their hive. So when you place your honeybee hives in an area of three to five miles that is dominated by a particular bloom, and you plan your harvest around that bloom, you are able to make sure that the honeybees are getting that nectar due to their flower fidelity. And flower fidelity uh, literally means that they want to gather the most uh, prolific bloom that they can find. And they will go back to that bloom over and over until it's depleted. So it's, it's quite an amazing combination of nature um, and the honeybees just being brilliant and then uh, some hard work for the beekeepers too uh, to make sure that they are placing those bee hives in a particular area. That's great. You know, people have questions a lot of times. They'll come in and ask me if it's a raw honey versus others. And then I started reading that there's a lot of honeys that have corn syrup added to it, and they're not labeled that way in the U.S. They don't seem to have to, just like in olive oil. There's a lot of um, manipulating going on with the olive oils, and they don't have to label it and things like that. Um, can you kind of tell us about that a little bit? Absolutely. So you're, you're very correct, um, especially when you're buying, um, you know, honey bear honey. Um, you can definitely be getting um, quite a lot of corn syrup. All of Savannah Bee's honeys are certified raw and they are also lab tested to be the particular percentage of the bloom that we claim them to be. 
So, you yeah. know, with Savannah Bee, you are getting raw, delicious honey in its most nutritional state. And you are, you're getting certified honey that has been lab tested to be that particular nectar source. Okay. And now, if the next question is how they test that, I am definitely going to be out of my, uh, <laughs> I am going to be over my head then. <laughs> we'll also have people that are looking for an organic certified, which is very difficult because bees are moving, you know, so they're not in one place. Um, it is very rare to find certified organic honey because then all of the, so let's say you have a farm, but then all of the farms for five miles around you have to also be certified organic. Exactly. So it does become very, very hard. And, and beekeeping is, you know, I don't, I don't think that many people are keeping bees uh, for, to be rich. And so uh, people keep bees because they love them and they love nature and they want to support our ecosystem. And so I, I think that I know with my husband and I, we have a, a farm that we're trying to get certified organic. And I could just see that not a lot of beekeepers, even the ones that are organic, might not want to spend the time and resources that it would take in order to get that certification. Exactly. Um, all right. So, um, now we are going on to our very top selling uh, product, which is our honeycomb. So this is raw honeycomb and that wooden frame you see it in um, is hand pulled from the hive. Um, our honeycomb is hand packaged, hand cut, um, and it is just such an exquisite treat. It's um, pretty rare to find honeycomb. Um, Terry, I'm sure you are probably one of the only sources of honeycomb in your particular area, I would think, right? I haven't seen it anywhere else. And I've yeah, been eating it all week. It's wonderful. <laughs> Delicious. It is, it is so yeah. good. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing. So not only is it 100% edible and 100% made by the bees, um, it's also honey in its purest and most nutritional state. Um, it is jam packed with vitamins and enzymes, minerals and pollen and antioxidants. And um, pollen is a wonderful source of protein, and it's, um, it's not only delicious, it's just so cool that you're getting the added nutrients. And one of the things that I really like about honeycomb is when you really look close, you'd have to zoom in to see, but each one of those little hexagon um, cells that the bees put the honey in, it's like their own little handmade Tupperware, right down to like a little lid, a little thin layer of beeswax. It's like when they get it all full and done, they're like, okay, we've done a great job. This cell is all full and ready for the fridge. And we, they put the <laughs> little lid on it and it's ready to go. Oh, honey. Now the wax, some people ask me about that and it is edible to eat it. It's whether you like it or not when you're having honeycomb. I always tell people. Yeah, it, it makes um, the honey, uh, it creates a way for the honey to be uh, wonderful to serve on a cheese board because whereas you might have to put a bowl of honey and it'd be going everywhere and running everywhere um, the honey the wax really holds the honey together so you get this uh, more chewy more spreadable version of, of the honey which is wonderful to spread onto bread and crackers with cheese and fresh veggies and things like that um, yep. I think the beeswax enhances the flavor too, personally. I, I think the flavor is a little, a little better. Yeah, oh, it comes in a little container just like this. It's great. So you can take um, a cheese board or dig right in it. And, that, and it never yeah. goes bad. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's we, have two, we have two questions for you. The okay. first is how often do the bees rebuild their comb? Okay. Um, so they, they're making honey. So we, uh, my husband and I just got um, two hives and installed them and they were something called nukes. So they came just like a box of bees with the queen. And um, it was amazing. We, um, we dumped them into the hive and we went back the very next day and it was unbelievable how much comb they had built. 
um, I don't think they ever really stop making comb. Like they're, they're going to make it. And that's the whole reason why beekeepers put frames and things like that, because they try to guide the honeybees to make the honeycomb a particular shape. Um, but, you know, I'm sure back in the paleo Paleolithic era, bees were making their hives in a hollowed out tree and hives were, you know, honeycomb was probably round, you know, who, who knows? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I, I think they are, I mean, the, the term busy bee is definitely for a reason. Like they are, they got right to work and every, we've checked on them a couple of more times and every day we've just, every, we have a check them every day, about every other day or every three days. And it's amazing how much more they've built. Wow. How long does honeycomb keep? How long does honeycomb keep? You said it's forever, right? Honey, all raw, mm -hmm, all raw honey is, is the only non-perishable food source. So the only honey in the entire world that absolutely never goes bad. That's fascinating. It's really cool. Because of honey being antibacterial and antifungal, um, so honey is so thick that bacteria can't live in it. And for that reason, um, it never goes bad. Wow, cool. You want to continue on from there, Danielle? Absolutely. Um, so there we go. Okay. One moment. <laughs> <It's only laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, these look one wonderful. second. I'm, yes, her dad is grabbing her. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the honeycomb platter. The first example that we have here is the um, salty, savory um, example. Um, I really love this for a quick appetizer or actually also a light dinner. Um, a couple of times a month, my husband and I will just have this as, as for a dinner. Um, you can go um, all out. You can caramelize some onions and bake a brie, um, or you can throw a bunch of raw ingredients on a platter and, and some crackers and, and go for it. I also love it with sourdough toast. Um, but I, I wanted to show these two examples for, in particular, for them being um, more of the salty and savory examples. Um, and so it's, it's really just delicious and goes on anything. Uh, it, is, it makes a perfect board. Yes, it does. Those boards make me hungry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so the next one, um, I'd like to show that it also can be a little bit more of um, a treat for kids. Um, kids love honeycomb. Uh, it's, it's crazy to think um, that something that could be so good for you could be um, such a hit with children. But um, I have had many kids, because of them learning about honeybees in school, they have a keen interest in honeycomb because it's so rare and you don't get to try it very often. So um, I, I think this top platter is a really good example of how you can kind of cater it to, to kids. You know, but I see there's a little... M&Ms, like one little naughty thing on there um, <laughs> to get them to like all the, the good for you stuff. Um, but I've never had a kid, I have never met a kid that was not pretty excited over honeycomb. Wow, that's And it that just goes to show that you can, yeah, you can do more of a dessert or breakfast type platter as well, um, opposed to the, to the savory and salty. Okay. And um, I think that honeycomb is an amazing way to really uh, mark an occasion and make, some, make an occasion more special. Um, it's great for brunches or barbecues, um, really, really wonderful for birthdays or anniversaries, um, and a great also movie or date night. Um, perfect for bridal showers and wedding showers and things like that as well. Um, and I know after all that we're going through now, we're going to be very excited to all get together mm -hmm. and have a big honeycomb platter. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so this is a little um, classic recipe that I found. Um, I hope you don't mind, Terry. I pulled this picture off your website. That a works. A very pretty well. picture. And um, I, you know, I 
love a quick uh, balsamic honey vinaigrette for both salad dressings and also for a marinade. Okay. And yeah, this is just a simple recipe and you can really do uh, whatever ratio you want. If you like it higher in vinegar, then that's no, no problem either. But um, a really great combo is just whichever, um, love that olive, uh, olive oil you have on hand and so a little bit of balsamic and then some honey. Um, I prefer Tupelo or black sage, but I'm sure the acacia will be perfect as well. And then some salt and pepper. And if you have some citrus on hand that you'd like to squeeze in, that's a really nice touch as well. Or you can just use the lemon, lime, or orange olive oil with it. And that just goes oh, yes. <laughs> right there. Lemon olive oil sounds so amazing. And um, I just wanted to touch on, for the um, ending of this slideshow, I wanted to touch on a little bit of what Ted was saying in his intro. Um, and that is that we are not just a honey company. We are a company of people that are beekeepers. And even if we don't keep bees, um, we are passionate about helping to save the honeybees. And we do this by several ways. Um, supporting beekeepers. Um, when you buy Savannah Bee Company honey, you are supporting beekeepers. Um, and then also um, our Bee Cause Project, which is the nonprofit that we started, and um, it is putting observation hives uh, in schools across the country. Our goal is to put at least a thousand observation hives in schools, and we're up to a couple of hundred already. Wow. And the thing that time to end 600. 600? Oh, 600? My gosh. oh my gosh, it's so cool. Yeah, so the, um, well, we're going to have to raise the number. It's going to have to be 2,000 gold <laughs> next. Um, and the, the, our thinking behind putting those observation hives in schools is um, to inspire the upcoming generation to love and appreciate the honeybees. And that's a, a very, I think, a, val a valuable thing to save the bees and also to protect our, our pollinators. Have the bees been making a little bit of a comeback from I mean, where I think they with were the a couple years ago? Years ago? Mm -hmm. I think that um, with the uh, I think with the backyard beekeeper becoming so much more popular, it has definitely helped to support the um, bee colony population. Right. Because I definitely think that there have there has been a growth in the interest in beekeeping. It used to be something that only people said, oh, my grandfather used to do this. And you're hearing more and more people are, are trying it, um, even in cities and, and urban areas. Yes. We have a question and, for you. How okay. Does, what's that? How does a school, oh, how does a a school apply school? to become a conservation school? You, you go to the beecause.org. Okay. Thebecalls.org, and you can apply right through there. It's a pay it forward program. So we donate the honey, and then the schools um, sell the honey to raise the money to get their um, to get their um, observation hive. So it's also a great lesson in um, you know helping, and then they help the next school get the yeah. observation hive. So um, oh. it's a a great lesson on working together, like the honeybees as well. There's and and we then we another, also yeah go ahead actually there's a couple um, oh yeah no let's go ahead with the questions that's perfect so there's one that's Ames Farm here in Minnesota rents beehives to folks is that a program that works for schools and other private homes I'm not familiar um, with that with that program of renting to Google what was what was the name of the farm Ames A M E S it's a um, yes. Yep, it's a local Minnesota company. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm sorry at this time I'm not familiar with them, so I I don't I don't know about I, I'm guessing they rent them for like an educational purpose um, or pollination. Or, oh yeah, or okay to pollinate their yes their crops their garden or, or something. Or nurse, uh huh. Okay, interesting. And yeah, thank you for yeah. thank you for telling me about that. Though I'll definitely look into it. Mm -hmm. Then the next one is, where are the honeycombs you're showing coming from? U.S. or Hungary? Maybe both. Um, 
So we do right now, most of our honeycomb is coming from Hungary, but occasionally we do get some other honeycombs. Um, earlier this year, we had an Amazonian honeycomb and um, occasionally we also have honeycomb from the U.S. But right now, the honeycomb is from Hungary. Okay. Great. Okay. You can continue on. Um, well, that was that was my last slide. Um, so now I'm I'm pretty much going to uh, leave it up to anything that you want to touch on, or if Andrea has anything she'd like to add. Um, well, you guys just let me know if there's anything else you want me to. Well, I do know um, Terry. I don't think the message from Ted was not seen. It, it was wasn't. Heard. <laughs> so can we try so everybody could see him in action? Yeah. Yes. We sure can. We'll Let's stop that sharing. One time. We're and going I'll to share for you here. Yeah. So if you hit the sc share screen on the bottom, okay, I'll pull it up for you. Let me see here. Reflect it. I don't see it. Oh, wait a minute. Share screen. Yes, on the very bottom. Here you go. Uh, it's not showing, Andrea. I'm the founder and president it's not showing. of the company, and I am very excited to be partnering with Love That Olive and with all yeah. of you who are interested in cooking with honey. I hope you're going to be really creative. Uh, we're way more than just a honey company. We're out to save the bees, and so any partnership is helping us do that. Uh, we work with beekeepers. We have a not-for-profit. We work with schools across the country, and we're always trying to raise awareness. So. Thank you for that, and, and y'all have fun tonight. There you go. Great. We were talking nice. about recipes before, and another favorite one of mine, and Andrea, you and I talked about this, was taking your honey and putting it on bacon and then cooking it in the oven. Oh, yeah. That is like heaven. Yes. <laughs> Candy bacon. bacon. That mm -hmm. sounds really good. Yeah, and you can add a little of the bourbon balsamic, and then... Oh my gosh, it's really, really good. I like to put honeycomb on just little pieces in a salad too. Little, it's little hints of like um, sweetness in your salad. It's really good. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm gonna show a couple of the um, bottles that we carry from you. Um, we do have this size. It's wonderful, and if you want, we have, these are so fantastic, the pumps that go on it, that you can just put a pump in and pump it right out. They work so well. We have that size in all of the three honeys. We also have them in the little jars, which are great for gifting and adding it with a oil or vinegar, which is really nice. Um, of course, Acacia, my favorite, isn't this gorgeous, this bottle? Oh, that's so pretty. It is so pretty, and when you turn it over, it has this great bubble <laughs> that my husband looks at all the time and plays with this bottle. It's so wonderful, the thickness in here. It is so good. We also have a, um, the acacia um, straws, the honey straws, which are great just to have with you to add to a sandwich or on your salad or add into tea during the day. They're great to have in your purse if you want a little, just a little bit of sweetness instead of having a candy bar. They work really, really well that way. And of course we have the honeycombs also in the store now. So three um, brand new products that we're so excited about and sharing with you. Now, anybody, do you have any more questions for us? Takes a minute. It takes a minute for them to come up <laughs> as they come. What's that? A honey lava lamp. Oh, someone said it was a honey lava lamp when I turn it over. It does look like a honey lamp. <laughs> <laughs> On there. Harry? Yes. Instead of, I always like, instead of getting a hostess gift of a bottle of wine, is to give someone a bottle of that beautiful honey. Isn't that nice? Yes, the flute size. It's very nice. such a great gift. I think it's a great gift for um, corporate, too. It's very unique for people. And, and you know what? It's so special, but all of us 
it's great to use in our daily life. You know, even though the bottles are pretty, use it, use it up. We always talk about that, how it's just so exciting to have a good product. And it takes very few ingredients when you have a good product that you're using and things um, like that. I know that actually you reminded me of something, Terry, that I should have touched on earlier. And um, that's one of the most wonderful things about substituting honey for sugar is that honey is not empty calories like sugar with with honey you are getting nutritional value and so anytime you make that choice to use honey instead of sugar um, you are making a healthier choice which is really great for something to be so delicious and actually good for you oh, that's great the other thing i use a lot of honey with is salmon and um, shrimp yeah. and scallops and things like that i just i really love it with seafood that way Someone actually just suggested a homemade teriyaki sauce. Oh, someone just suggested a homemade teriyaki sauce with salmon. Oh, that okay. sounds amazing. Oh. Yeah. It's also really good doing salmon and then on the side on your grill, um, do strawberries with a little bit of the honey and saute them up and put it right with the salmon as a side dish. It's fabulous. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we're in peach country down here and uh, we love to... Uh, grill peaches with honey oh, okay. and put them, it's really really good yes we always talk about grilling peaches with vanilla olive oil and then we put in the center some balsamic and Ooh, some ice cream but honey delicious right in there too yes add a little bit more flavor and things so well great i'm going to um add a few little things about a couple classes coming up too. I'm so happy that you guys joined us tonight because I really absolutely love honey. Absolutely love honey. And so I have fun with it. And, and Andrea, I saw you um, at a trade show. And I think it was January when it was very, very cold here. <laughs> and you yes. coming in for it. And you had come up to me and said, would you be interested in honey? And I said, you know, I have enough honey lines. I said, the only honey I want is acacia and I can't find it. And you turned around and said, I've got it. And I was so excited. <laughs> and I was so excited to have some, yes, I was so excited to know that somebody knew about acacia honey. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. That honey's in the world. You're right. I know. You could ask my son. He carried it all over Italy to bring it home. <laughs> Cases of it for my staff and for us. <laughs> so he's very happy that we have it in the store now. I won't have to carry it anymore <laughs> through all the cities of, of Italy. Well, coming up, uh, we have quite a few things um, happening this week still. We, of course, have our cheese class. Quite a few people have got the kits for that, but if you don't have a kit, please join us Friday night, May 1st at 7 o'clock for our cheese class, and we'll be talking about a variety of cheeses from Minnesota, a company called Redhead Creamery. We'll also... Oh, I like that. <laughs> on Friday, and we'll have an acacia um, honey in that kit also. Very good. And Friday also, our Twin Cities Live got moved to Friday. So Channel 5 on Friday from 3 to 4, check us out. We'll be doing a recipe for Mother's Day. We all think that we'll still be home for Mother's Day, but we want our moms to have a nice dinner. So we have planned a dinner that you can drop off and she can put right into the oven and have for herself with a nice dessert. So we're doing a roasted lemon chicken with vegetables. Um, we're having a lemon pound cake with strawberries and we are also doing a garlic breadstick. And we are using the acacia honey in that recipe. So that's Friday. And then we just set our class for our Greek producers, our Greek olive oil producers. Um, Diamantis will be with us for sure, and we're trying to convince his brother Dino to come on also with us. And that class will be, we just have to look at my date, Thursday, May 7th at 6.30 p.m. And Diamantis is going to come on and talk to us about the Greek olive oils that we carry from their company. 
and um, especially about the Koroniki estate oil, which we have in stock right now. It's a very special olive oil. He'll talk about their write-up they were given in Forbes magazine showing that they're the up and coming olive oil producers in the world, which is fantastic. And we have a lot of their flavored oils and they also flavor balsamic vinegars and they're some of your favorites like lemon cucumber is one of them. You'll love that. The new Greek seasoned is fantastic. You have to um, check that one out with us also. We will be coming up with the kit for that one and I will introduce that through Facebook or email in the next few days on that. So thank you everyone. Thanks to the two of you for sharing the honey experience with us tonight. We're really excited and we hope to start sharing in Minnesota some Savannah Bee honey. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you, Terry. We really appreciate you and your partnership. And we appreciate the new partnership with you. And thanks again to all my incredible customers and everybody here tonight supporting me and learning something with us. Have a great night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.